I, I have to be responsible now because I believe we're live. We're live streaming, right? We're live streaming. So, uh, and luckily, I have nothing but obviously nerds in my crowd. So, um, so my name is Joel Gordon, and I work for Matter Hackers. Uh, I'm the senior solution specialist. Matter Hackers is the largest 3D printing solutions company in the U.S. Um, if you don't know about Matter Hackers, you should know about Matter Hackers. Um, and in fact, we're we're doing a uh, $300. Um, gift card giveaway. So if you haven't registered for that yet, you need definitely need to register for, for a free gift card. Um, so today, um, they asked me to talk about a lot of stuff. Um, uh, Fayetteville Public Library, I've been working with the Makerspace downstairs for a while. Um, I uh, have actually been working in the Maker movement for uh, over 20 years now. Um, and what was uh, helped to found and was an executive director at the Arkansas Regional Innovation Hub. I um, uh, was there for years and uh, have worked in education with kids, particularly around children's museums, science museums, and uh, now working for Matter Hackers, which is a wonderful place. We're based out of Los Angeles. I get to live still in the Ozarks, which is where I want to be and uh, get to travel all over the country and work with folks who are really, really interested in, um, in 3D printing technologies and digital technologies. But with that in mind, uh, one of the things that I said when uh, Fayetteville Library asked me to do this is I said, well, I could talk about this or I could talk about this or I could talk about this. And they went, that's great. And I went, okay, so what I have to behind me right now, uh, as much as I hate PowerPoint, I have a uh, Franken presentation uh, where I'm going to talk a little bit about everything. So uh, this is a, a presentation I put together uh, kind of swiftly to talk about a lot of stuff. So I hope you don't get bored. But uh, So maker spaces in the 21st century maker economy. Uh, a few years ago, I got invited to uh, go to Capitol Hill and talk about um, the maker movement and some things that were happening and got super excited about it. So let's talk a little bit about that. So uh, makers. Typically, when we think about makers, these are the kind of folks that we think of. Uh, I would argue that we're kind of all makers. So uh, when I look at pictures like this, I look and I see people who are manipulating materials and they're making things that are functional, and that's those are makers. Um, so where does it start, right? Well, you know, one day you're making mud pies, and the next thing you know, you're throwing pots, right? Um, play, hobby, and careers. This is a big deal for me. Um, where I think careers really come from, things that we get passionate about, uh, first comes play, right? We all start playing our games. We start to explore things. We find things that we're interested in. Play becomes pastime. It's that thing that we choose to do more often. And then pastime becomes hobby. And for me, hobby is where you start to invest in what you're doing. So you begin to buy tools. You uh, carve out time so that you can spend time doing that hobby. And then if you're lucky, hobby becomes career. Um, <laughs> Sir Ken Robinson, one of my favorite um, lecturers. Uh, we, don't grow into, uh, we don't grow into creativity. We grow out of it. Or rather, we get educated out of it which I completely believe. Um, I am uh, one of the uh, pro possibly most undereducated people who's been on uh, the day as today. But um, still went to college, still got my degree, uh, absolutely, but my degree was in no way in technology. Uh, I have a degree in uh, technical theater, and, and it's completely an arts degree. My first job was as an artist. Uh, it just was never a... Uh, not a nomenclature I was really comfortable with. When people called me an artist, it, it, it felt like they were talking about somebody else. Um, developing skills is really, yes? Yeah. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I will, I will tell you, though, um, the, the educators that really made a difference for me were the military. So right out of high school, I went into the Air Force. 
And the Air Force was the first thing that I ever did where I tested or did anything where people looked at me and said, hey, you're really smart. Because when I was in school, I really spent – I didn't spend a lot of time on the books. I spent time doing the things that I was interested in, which meant that um, what I what the way I really got out of high school was that I could take a test and I could answer the questions, but I didn't want to do the homework. I didn't want to do, you know, I wanted, there were things I wanted to do and that wasn't it. So yeah, when I got into, when I got into the Air Force and uh, I was suddenly studying something I was interested in, in electronics, I did, I excelled. And, uh, and yeah, so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and what you're talking about is skills, skills development, right? So, uh, it's, it is a lot about repetition. It's doing it and trying it. It's being self-motivated. And play, and this is an important thing, I think it, especially play with others, where you're actually finding people who are like-minded. Uh, and, and this is my philosophy. You don't get good at jumping rope by reading the text, right? You got to do it. You, you, you know, oh, let's see, what's this rope jumping thing about? I'll figure that one out. Um, <laughs> where did it begin? Uh, I love this picture because these are, are Clovis points. Um, and Clovis points are, are uh, the first manufactured tool. And what I mean by that is that you can look at a Clovis point, you can in immediately identify it as a Clovis point. In a way, it's a multi-tool because it could be used as a spear or you could make a knife blade out of it or any variety of things, an arrowhead. And uh, what is really interesting about Clovis points for me is this map. So this map actually shows where Clovis points have been found in the U.S. and the Clovis culture, right? But it, what's interesting to me is that the darkest spots are where it's been most concentrated. But if you look at where they're spread out, and then suddenly it's over here. And this is the Paleolithic, right? So that's sharing knowledge. That was somebody who said, hey, I've got this really great idea, and they open sourced it. You know, they didn't just go, well, we're going to put a trademark on that and do it. And that's what made an entire culture explode, right? This this sharing of knowledge. So makerspaces, I think that's what makerspaces are. Oh, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And makerspaces are about that, right? So where did it all begin? Hackers, uh, Linus Torvald, I love this quote. Uh, hacker isn't a bad word. Hackers see puzzles. They solve problems. Crackers break things. Codes, programs, locks. They get past security. We've forgotten that term. You know, we've sort of lumped hackers under this whole hackers are bad, right? But hacker spaces, uh, chaos communication camp, DEF CON, ShmooCon, if you're a giant uh, nerd and are into this, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, but the first hacker space that I ever got to visit was Seabase in Berlin. Um, so I've been interested in maker spaces and this, I, this concept for so long in my life. And I worked in film and television for years and I got a chance while I was in Berlin uh, to act, I actually met up with somebody. And back in those days, if you wanted to get into Seabase, you had to uh, like know somebody at Seabase, right? It was a hacker community. It was very closed in. It was very tight. You, uh, you, you had to know people to get to the door. And what's really interesting about that door is the entrance to Seabase is basically a door in the side of a building in an alleyway. Like if you don't know it's there, you don't know it's there. And, uh, you know, this is, this is what it looks like. A lot of the graffiti that's on that, the stickers, the people who've shown up. Actually, there's one sticker on here that makes me laugh. Right up here on the right, that's actually, uh, well, I'll show you in a second. Uh, anyway, but when you get through that door, what you see is the exciting part, right? You walk in the door. This is, this is the entryway. You walk in. This is a shared community space. This is uh, a typical lecture at Seabase. This is what that looks like. It's a very unusual space, right? Really cool, really cool. 
uh, hackerspaces, makerspaces. So hackerspaces were very um, uh, closed up. They weren't inclusive. You had to know somebody to get in the door. It was, you know, it was that situation. Noise bridge. So that sticker that I showed you on the door was actually a noise bridge sticker on the door at Seabase. Uh, noise bridge, uh, San Francisco is the first makerspace, at least the first one I know of in the U.S., pretty sure. But uh, noise bridge out of San Francisco uh, was a different attitude. They were inclusive. They wanted people to come in and share knowledge and, and let's explore this idea. Let's build a community. So uh, they were very into coding and programming, electronics, art and fabrication, uh, particularly electronic arts. Um, and back in those days, electronic arts was mostly uh, sound and lighting and, and things like that. Um, but a very inclusive space, very open, very different from what you might experience at Seabase, right? But they're kind of, you know, they sort of parallel one another. Um, access to tools and materials, community and support, skills and knowledge, and time. Those are the critical things that make a maker sp a space. So just having access to those tools and materials, uh, becoming part of that community where you can get the support of others who've had the experience and can actually share knowledge that you're seeking, right? That's how you really want to learn. So that skills and knowledge and then time is so critical. You have the time to do it because it's there, it exists. It's not something that you're building from scratch or trying to de dig deep into the internet to figure out. Um, <laughs> stone Back to Stone Age tools, right? Um, so everything changed suddenly, you know, suddenly we had, not only do we have access to tools and I think the first maker spaces were like, you know, uh, during the, um, uh, during uh, some of the earlier periods in the U.S. where, where uh, like the Depression, for instance, during the Depression, there were co-ops that exploded. And a co-op was basically, well, Joe's got a plow. Uh, this guy's got a thresher. We can share these tools with one another because people couldn't afford to buy more or new so they would work together you know it's where we got barn raisings right we're gonna we're gonna raise a barn the whole community is gonna get together and do this i in a way i think that was a maker space and uh there's a really pleasant history around that but when we started to get into tools like this these, <laughs> these stone age tools uh these early 3d printers suddenly um, manufacturing was becoming democratized. You had an, an opportunity with this tool to cr actually create something uh, and multiply it. Uh, so you could get into iteration. You could begin to uh, figure out how to um, uh, try things out rapidly. Um, and then that opened up a whole new opportunity. Suddenly, because of tools like that, you had... Um, Things that really were sort of limited to very focused college courses or very particular certification courses that you could get into that were more about manufacturing. It was never a hobby thing to be able to run a CNC machine or have a 3D printer. And I used my first 3D printer 30 years ago this year. Um, so having access to that was just the most amazing thing, right? And these spaces began to crop up. There were big spaces and small spaces, and, and uh, that was really exciting. And we were growing a community in the United States, and we were all really excited, and we wanted to celebrate. And uh, that's when I discovered Burning Man. Uh, do you guys know what Burning Man is? Okay. Do you know what Burning Man is? So Burning Man is an arts festival. Um, it happens in uh, Black Rock, Nevada, which is a city that only exists for a couple of weeks a year. Uh, in the middle of the desert, Nevada, they, they build up Burning Man. And uh, it is definitely an arts festival. It is really spectacular. Uh, there's a lot of digital arts uh, that is being done, um, sculptural, visual arts. But the really cool thing about Burning Man was that suddenly you had a bunch of people, uh, self-described burn builders, who were into technologies and manipulating technologies and creating things that, you know, they that you couldn't even imagine, and uh, doing it for the sake of art alone, right? Not for profit, not for, but just to create art and spectacle. And uh, a lot of those people in the early days of Burning Man were 
uh, became executives in Silicon Valley and were creating companies that were developing uh, computer systems and amazing things. But they were meeting each other at events like this. And then eventually they started growing up and we had kids and families and then things change. Uh, so we still wanted to get together. We still wanted to celebrate this idea, but, you know, it, it things get off the rail, and we all have to be responsible, and we have to take care of our families and earn a living and that sort of thing, but we still want to celebrate these things. So luckily, this guy came along. This is Dale Doherty. Uh, Dale created uh, – he, he uh, worked for um, actually a technical press. Um, you guys will have to help me remember. Riley. He worked for uh, for Riley Press. You know, if you've done any coding back in the day, we all had had Riley um, books. Uh, Dale worked for them, and he wrote articles, and he discovered this group of people, and he became fascinated with them, and he coined this phrase, the maker movement. And uh, it, it was a magical moment for me when I really started to go, oh, that's my community. I'm part of the maker movement. And this um, this term artist, you know, that I was never comfortable with. Suddenly I had a new term that I and I and I tried other things. I was an artist, a designer, a fabricator, a uh, engineer. Um, my title was engineer for a long time. Never went to school for engineering. But um, but I, I loved this idea of being a maker because it felt universal and it felt inclusive and it felt like I was part of a community. And it didn't set me apart uh, because a welder could be a maker or a sculptor could be a maker. But we could all be makers together instead of getting pigeonholed. Well, you're an artist. You're an industrialist. You're this. If you're a maker, you're a maker, right? Um, and that brought on Maker Fair and Make Magazine. And uh, suddenly we had this, not only do we have a community of people, but we had a way that we could all stay in touch. We had a touchstone. Um, we had Maker Fair, and I went to my first Maker Fair, I can't even remember when, year two of Maker Fair uh, in San Mateo, the, the uh, original flagship Maker Fair, which launched again today. So, uh, so well, last night, according to a lot of my friends who were texting me, but um, with, so Maker Fair in, in the Bay Area is back, which is exciting. Um, but this idea of Make Magazine, you know, when Make Magazine first came out and you could meet the makers, you could meet these people who were doing really unusual, exciting things, that was huge for me. I was, uh, I, I've, I've been interviewed in Make Magazine years ago, and it was one of the proudest moments of my life. I was like, wow, this is just spectacular. And the fact that I have friends, <laughs> friends like Emily right there on the cover, and Dale Doherty and uh, all this community of people that I absolutely love. And I come to events like this today, and people keep walking up to me because I know them because th these are my people, and it, it's exciting. Um, that uh, movement got noticed at one point, and uh, I, was, uh, I was in New York at World Maker Fair, and I was giving a talk kind of like this, and – um, this young lady walked up to me. Her name's Stephanie Santoso. And Stephanie said, hey, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I'd really like to talk to you more. And she handed me her business card. And I looked at her business card. And I said, Stephanie Santoso, uh, Office of Technology, White House. And I went, oh, okay, that's cool. you know." And she goes, well, I'll be in touch. And I said, okay. Figured I'd never hear from her again. And then about 30 days later, I got a phone call, and she said, hey, would you be willing to come to Washington and be part of a panel that we're hosting? So that was the beginning of something called Nation of Makers. Uh, Nation of Makers is a 501c3 organization that is really uh, there more to advocate for makers, which has really changed over the last 10 years. But uh, it was this guy, Obama, maybe you've heard of him, who just sort of took notice of it and said, you know, technology is important, education is important, this whole maker movement, people are doing really exciting things with science and engineering, and uh, I, I think that's important and we need to highlight that. And uh, it became part of the technology panel uh, under the Obama White House. And then uh, after uh, Obama left office, um, we became an independent organization. Uh, but what it was ultimately about was innovation. And what everyone was interested in was innovation and these creative people who were innovating. 
And it, now innovation, uh, unfortunately for me, is like one of these terms that we keep throwing around. Like uh, there's actually a, and this is no slight to them at all. I'm sure they're a wonderful organization, but there's a company in Bentonville called Innovation Plumbing. And uh, I just sort of wonder, really, what's so innovative about your plumbing, you know? But it's one of those words that we all got really excited about this idea of innovation at one point, which we should have. But it's one of those things now that I, I'm a little pickier about what I term innovation, right? But innovation was where it was at. And that idea of innovation and this idea of these uh, hackers and makers who were creating things suddenly got people really inspired people who were holding the purse strings right and they said well here's what we need to do we need to take this idea and we need to start making uh, more of these how do we copy and paste this how do we begin to create this and we started creating uh, not just maker spaces but innovation spaces and I was lucky enough to help found one of these innovation spaces which for me is just a maker space you know it's a place where people can go uh, and uh, it did really well. It was, it's still a wonderful place, um, but it was, uh, it was still this idea of innovation and what is it you want out of innovation. And unfortunately, in the United States, I think sometimes we get a little more hung up with we want to sell an idea more than we want to sell a thing. And makers are more about the thing, right? So... We created things. We made things that were spectacular and got people excited and wanted to motivate people to do things. So we had events like Beer, Brats, and Bots. Remember Beer, Brats, and Bots? Um, where uh, we had families and groups who were not just excited about robotics, not just a robotics event for robotics people, but a robotics event where roboticists got to do really cool things and artists got to do really cool things. We were creating these landscapes that the robots were battling on. It was just incredible. And, uh, and not only that, but, you know, everybody was sort of working with the same platform of robot, but how they armored it and what they did with it was sort of up to them. Some of them were visually spectacular. Others were very, very engineered and very specific. And that was, for me, the exciting part, right? But it was about um, inspiration, right? It was more about inspiring people. And then we had things like this, you know. You have uh, that, and yeah, that's me. Um, but that's our that was uh, our governor, uh, BB, and uh, panelist uh, gentleman who's off screen right there was actually a uh, um, delegate from China who was visiting. But it was a lot of folks who were interested in what we were doing and how it worked and ways that that energy could infuse itself into other things that needed that energy. Uh, like manufacturing in the U.S., right? So the maker movement is changing. I'm okay with that, and you should be too. Hacker spaces, maker spaces, innovation space. Call it what you want, you know? And that was a moment in maker spaces where you started to see, kind of like churches, where churches start to schism. You sort of saw a lot of makers who were like, I don't want anything to do with that. And, uh, and that was fine, you know? Everybody sort of had their own thing to do. And we all sort of, you know, hugged and went our separate directions. And uh, then uh, we started to think about things like this. Like, we still wanted to be makers, but who are makers? Artisan, bespoke, crafted, custom, handmade, unique, prototype. There's a term that I, um, I always like the word craft. I think craft is a really powerful word, but this term of arts and crafts, you know, the arts and crafts movement was the spectacular moment in the history of the world, really, but particularly the United States. And then arts and crafts became suddenly at some point, And that was the thing that I think we were all sort of afraid of. Is it going to get watered down? Is it going to be glue sticks and construction paper? Right. And I always said, well, I love the term craft, but maybe we need, maybe it needs to be like K-R umlau A-F-T, you know, like craft, like it's suddenly this weighty, weighty term because we're describing it in a different way. But 
at the end of the day, it's all of these things, right? It's all of these things. They're kind of the same thing. It's artisan. It's bespoke. It's crafted. It's custom. It's handmade. It's unique. It's a prototype. These are all like one-offs, right? This is the special thing. But change in the couch cushions. So that's a term that was, that was uh, used by a senator who will remain unnamed from another state. But I was on Capitol Hill, and I was talking about the maker economy, which I'm about to get into. And I described what the ma maker economy was and that there are people who are doing – it's basically small businesses. We're all entrepreneurs in a way. And this, this uh, senator said to me, he goes, you know, this is – I really love your talk, and this is very inspiring, but at the end of the day, you're talking about change in the couch cushions. And I said, yeah, senator, but what if I could give you access to every couch in the world, Right? Suddenly, that's like saying, I'm going to pay you in quarters and you turning it down. But then they're going, well, I'm going to pay you in quarters. I'm going to pay you a quarter today and tomorrow I'm going to give you two quarters. And then the third day I'm going to give you four quarters. And then the fifth day I'm going to give you eight quarters. By the end of the month, you've got a million dollars, you know, more than. But, they, you know, getting people to see that has been tough. So. It, it is, but it's also, it's also to get people to make couch cushions, right? But, um, but instead, we're, yeah, but our mindset is more about, you know, well, yeah, I mean, it's great that you make couch cushions, but, uh, you know, I want somebody who can make a, a bajillion-dollar app, right? Well, nobody makes bajillion-dollar apps anymore. It's been done, you know, but, uh, but if, I can, if I can do this, so this is the Etsy effect. This is, this is real math. So I looked up, when I did this, I, I looked up what is the average population of Etsy businesses in a region. So this is, we'll, we'll say in the state of Arkansas. We'll just go with in the state of Arkansas. We've got 500 people who are selling on Etsy. The average income of someone selling on Etsy is $500. So 500 people times 500, five, and I should say $500 a month. $500 a month. It's a little side hustle, making 500 bucks a month. That's great. Good for you. But 500 people making $500 a month is $250,000 a month. $250,000 a month times 12 is $3 million a year. Times 50 states. You see where I'm going with this? But here's the deal. The math is wrong. Because in the U.S. last year, Oh, and this is the important part. Imagine if this was a company. Imagine if I went up to a senator and said, yeah, there's a company that wants to come to your city they're making, or your state. They're making $3 million a year. Well, you'd get tax subsidies. You'd get this. But there's nothing there for makers yet, right, getting there. But imagine if this was a company. Here's the problem with the math. Last year in the U.S., Makers on Etsy earned $8 billion. Makers on Etsy. And that's the makers, not Etsy. Right. Right. But how do we define entrepreneurs today? Is an entrepreneur a small business? Well, that's our problem. It, it could be. But unfortunately, the entrepreneurial ecosystem that we really developed in the last 20 years, and particularly in the last decade, has been more about selling an idea. It's been the people who are, I have this great idea, here it is, cure for cancer, really? I'm just looking for investors. That's fabulous. We're going to get on the, on the early floor with that. Yeah. Well, but if, but if at the end of the day, there's nothing made, right? At the end of the day. And then investors lose their money, but somebody got rich. Somebody sold the company and they got rich. So what if, what if it was this? What if it was just like we're, we're investing in makers, right? This is manufacturing in the United States. So this is where we're at now. Here we go. <laughs> Here's the crazy thing about this. Most of these charts only go up to about 2010 because there's so little manufacturing in the U.S. right now that there's not any good data to create more. So here's what we got. 3D printing, huh? Sounds cute. 
COVID-19. So during COVID-19, a group of people that I knew, and I was working from home at the time because we all were, a group of people that I knew from back in the Burning Man days and Maker Faire days, they called me and they said, hey, do you still have uh, studio space? Are you still, you know, and and I said, yeah. And they, they were like, if we send you some drawings, can you make some stuff for us and send it here? And that was the beginning of an organization called the Open Source Medical uh, Device Network. So uh, I got involved in that about day three. Uh, 90 days later, this is what we had. 90 days later, we had uh, about 45,000 volunteers worldwide, mostly volunteers, about 98% volunteers worldwide. Um, we made... 25,198,046 face shields. And by face shields, like the actual face shields, the PPE that nobody could get. My brother and my sister-in-law are both emergency room doctors. My brother called me from Florida and said, can you make these? And I said, yes. So I was personally manufacturing face shields just for my brother's ER, just for him, and couldn't find it. We couldn't get the manufacturing in the United States couldn't ramp up fast enough. They didn't do it. They couldn't do it. Um, We created 7,622,053 disposable protective gowns, mostly volunteers. This is so at the at the result was this 48,392,965 total items produced Some of those were parts for heart valve machines. Some of those were breathing units. Some of those were life-saving critical equipment that couldn't be gotten otherwise. Here's the result. That's cool. Too bad it only prints plastic. So metal 3D printing. How many of you know about metal 3D printing? You do. A little bit. Um, Completely 3D printed. And in fact, that was 3D printed on an $800 3D printer at my house. It's 316L steel. It's manufacturable material. Incredible precision. Just in the last few years... 3D printing has suddenly become a topic again, right? Suddenly, everybody's going, whoa, um, okay, uh, we need to talk. So now we're at a point where we're trying to figure things out because COVID-19 happened. This boat got turned sideways in the Suez Canal, cost us like $10 billion a day or something. And suddenly we're going, okay, well, we have to do this thing we're calling reshoring. So now we're saying, all right, we need to bring manufacturing back to the United States, but what's that going to look like? Are we going to give the money for that to the same people who sent the jobs overseas in the first place? Because that worked before, so maybe we just need to get past this, right? So I work for a company that um, when they started – the makers and education were sort of their biggest partners, right? Uh, Matter Hackers now it's it is literally the biggest three D printing solutions company in the U S. But you know our customers are schools, K through twelve, university, individual makers, folks who are selling on Etsy. You saw those folks today if you walk through the hall. Um, we are working with industry who is incorporating 3D printing, but not only 3D printing, digital tooling of all kinds, desktop digital tooling. So, uh, and then one of our biggest customers today is actually the Department of Defense. And why would the DOD be interested in 3D printing or or these other um, readily available sort of desktop uh, opportunities? And at the end of the day, just like COVID-19, it's a little bit about saving lives, right? It's it's not just saving lives in the obvious sense of I'm making a piece for a respiratory machine. 
It's saving lives by creating jobs. It's saving lives by um, stopgap manufacturing. It's but then it went beyond stopgap. Now there are companies in the U.S. that are wholesale doing manufacturing, uh, additive manufacturing, where only a few years ago, and I don't know if anyone in here has a manufacturing background, but uh, one of the uh, mindsets that we have in the U.S. Is, si is Sigma manufacturer. Six Sigma is kind of the pinnacle, right, of manufacturing. It's about efficiency. 3D printing is not Sigma. 3D printing is not a, it was never considered Sigma. It's not part of Sigma. Uh, I Over and over again, 3D printing, that's real cute. It's not Sigma. All of those folks that I talked to years ago who said, yeah, that's cute, those are the folks who are calling me today, and not only are they calling me today and integrating it into their own systems, but the, one of the biggest reasons that folks are calling mat matter hackers today is, yes, we want the equipment, but also we want the training, we want the installation, and while you're at it, who can we hire in our region to work out a maintenance contract on the equipment? And our answer at the time being is, well, nobody. Because years ago when we were all saying, look, 3D printing, and even industry would say, hey, 3D printing is going to save the world. 3D, 3D printing, manufacturing said that because it was cool and it got good press. Now they need it, and it's a cart before the horse situation. We don't have people trained. People don't know how to design for it. They, But do you know who does know? Makers. So what if? And here's the difference. Now, the folks that we're hooking up manufacturing with are people in makers because we know maker spaces around the country. We know people in those maker spaces who are knowledgeable, that we can trust, and we're going, hey, let me introduce you to somebody. And now, suddenly, businesses are going, okay, you don't have to have a degree, but you do need a certification. So the problem is, is that that certification doesn't exist. So now they're all, we're all scrambling, trying to figure out how do we get people, what is it going to look like to certify and say this person is certified to do this job, jobs that haven't existed until now. And not only do they exist now, but they are growing exponentially. We can't keep up because we need it that much, right? So what if? Amazon versus Kinko's. What if manufacturing of the 21st century was different? What if it was different? So this is the example that I give. Amazon is a great company. I buy stuff from Amazon all the time. But as a company, what does Amazon manufacture? Nothing. Amazon manufactures nothing. So let's say that tomorrow... All of these small companies that are providing product to Amazon, what if all of those companies tomorrow said, no, nah, I don't really want to sell on Amazon anymore. What does Amazon have to sell? They have nothing. What does Amazon have? Amazon has a lot of real estate because Amazon as a model is a lot of giant boxes, 8 million square foot boxes that are filled with lots of boxes. And those boxes are sitting on a shelf waiting for people to buy, right? But if people never buy those boxes, then what do we have? We have waste. It's just waste. So that's kind of the business model that we've been working from, right? That we're going we're gonna to get it made cheaply. We're going to bring it in. And that's the disposable economy. But what if it was different? What if it was Kinko's? And here's what I mean by you guys remember Kinko's, right? So I always held Kinko's up as an example because back in the day, Kinko's was actually a makerspace. And here's what I mean by that. You walk into Kinko's, if you wanted to make prints, you use their printers. And really back in the day, they would give you that cube. Remember those? You take a cube and you'd stick it into the 3D printer and it would literally just a little, little numbers would turn. Like analog numbers would turn every copy right? And uh, like a clicker counter, right? But that was a makerspace. You went in, you paid to use their equipment. You paid for the access to that equipment to, uh, you know, somebody came over and showed you how to use it and then you could use it, right? That's a makerspace. That's the model of a makerspace. What is Kinko's now? Kinko's is FedEx uh, office. So what do you do now? Do you go in and use their printers? So what are they? They're not a makerspace anymore. 
They're a print service. Here's, here's what I say they are. They are a micro-manufacturing facility. And here's what I mean by that. You walk in off the street, you take a thumb drive out of your pocket, you hand it to them, and you go, I need 80 copies of that. I need it spiral bound. I want plastic covers on the outside. And when you get them all done, I need you to put them in a box, and here's where I need them shipped. And what do they do? They say, okay, we'll do that. So what would a Kinko's of the 21st century look like, right? Kinko's of the 21st century. So now we have all of these digital tools. We have a way to, if you give me a file, I can share knowledge but all the way back to that first thing I talked about, sharing of knowledge, right? I can share knowledge with you through an email. I can share knowledge with you from through a thumb drive. I can create a design for that personal protection equipment, and I can share it with people on the other side of the world. And in moments they can begin manufacturing that object, right? When uh, when COVID was going on, I had a hospital contact me and say, if we send you a drawing, could you look at it and, and see if this is something you can manufacture? So it was a doctor in Korea who had created a box, an acrylic box, and uh, it was for intubating a patient in the emergency room. So what they would do with the acrylic box is they would put it over the person's head and shoulders or a couple of holes in the back that the doctor could reach through and you could intubate a patient, and when they would aspirate during the intubation process, it wasn't their spit flying all over the nurses and the doctors. It was staying inside the box, right? So I came up with a design, just a real quick CAD design, and it was just flat panels of acrylic that uh, finger locked together. You could take it apart, and it could store flat, and I put it out and a couple of hospitals tried it and then I put the uh, along with a friend put the designs out on the internet free to anyone who wanted to use them open source here you go I'm saving lives three days later I got phone calls at two o'clock in the morning from France from Ireland from Germany with doctors saying we want to make this but has it been tested? And I say, yes, it was tested at our hospital here locally. These are the doctors who worked, we worked with. It's been done. My brother is a doctor in Florida. They're using it currently. And they said, great, but we need to get it made. Can you make it and send it to us? And I'd say, well, where are you? And they'd say, well, I'm in Dublin. And I'd go, oh, okay. Well, in Dublin, there's a makerspace called this. And they would go to the makerspace and they would have it made. Germany was the same thing. I'd say, you need to talk to these people. They're here. And they had it made. France was the same thing. Talk to these folks. They'll get it taken care of. I lived in Paris for uh, a little over a year, and I knew spaces in Paris. Go see these folks. Three weeks after I posted those designs online, I got an ad on my Facebook page because at that time we were all communi communicating by Facebook. I got an ad on my Facebook page from a company in Pittsburgh that was selling my design. To take a design from prototype to manufacturing in less than three weeks never gets done. And they took a free idea that was saving lives and they started making profit off of it. But you know what? Fine. Do it. But I knew it was mine. I knew it was my design because I could look at the picture and the finger locks that I did on it. It was a very particular design, and I knew it was mine immediately. But that's insane. So that is all the naysayers who for years said, well, this won't work. It was working, right? So people took note of it. So yeah, it's, it's huge. So anyway, that's it, right? It's the what if factor. So thanks for listening to me ramble. And do you guys have any questions? Do we want to just talk now? The metal? Yeah, come on, come on up. I've got a few different objects that I've made. We sell, we sell printers. I have a customer who shall remain unnamed, but they do um, custom work for uh, boats, ships. And uh, depending on who's buying the ship, they want their instrument panel laid out a certain way. So rather than make 
eight different or how many ever thousands of different panels that they would have to injection mold or CNC or do whatever to, they just 3D print them. So they use a 3D, a very large format 3D printer called a Modix. And uh, when somebody come, tells them, I want my instrument panel laid out like this, they just go, okay, and they print the armature for the, uh, for the ship. And all the, the instruments mount in that armature. This is something that I just made recently. So I designed this. This is a, uh, another company that shall remain unnamed, but it's a product that we sell. And uh, the uh, product itself has these nylon nuts that hold these gaskets together uh, so that it keeps water in. And if they're loose, it just leaks like a sieve. But um, the way that it was set up, the, these, the only way I could get in and tighten these things was by hand. And if I got a wrench that was big enough to actually get on them, it wouldn't fit. So I went home that day and just designed this for myself as a tool that I desperately needed. Then I sent it to that company and said, hey, guys, why don't you send people these files? And they're doing it now. And this is the tool that they can use. And it's just, and I reinforced it in a couple of odd ways because it's just PLA. Because I knew most people are just going to print on PLA, but I wanted them to get enough force on it to actually be able to really tighten these things down. And uh, yeah, so they, they just share this file out now. Oh, of course, yeah. I, l I love that. I love the whole idea of it. That would actually work together, yeah. If you have you ever been to Asia? So one of the, one of the things that to me was visiting like Thailand and Korea and you <laughs> where in the United States I grew up on a farm and you know it's everything's John Deere or International Harvester and it's they're gigantic you know and you know my my uncle had a harvester that you know had uh, CD player and air conditioning and, you know, I mean, just insane. But you go to a place like Thailand and it's, uh, and they're, they're planting acres. I mean, a hundred acres and all they've got is like a, a walk behind tiller, you know, but that tiller has not only like not only does it have tiller blades, but it's got you know uh, tine tine forks. It's got this. They don't have tractors. And what's really wild is they will take that same two wheeled tiller with a big old Briggs and Stratton engine on top, and they'll they'll weld a little hook on the back of it, and they'll go over and they'll get a two wheeled cart, big giant two wheeled cart that's, you know, four feet or six feet high walls on the side, they'll fill it with whatever it is they're harvesting. Then they'll pull that tiller up with, you know, extended arms on it, and they will take that hook and they'll put it into like a little pin. The arm will have like a little pintle in the end. They'll catch that hook and then just lift up on those handlebars, and that tiller will just drive them into town with that cart, you know, and I'm, I'm, I looked at the first time I saw that, I was like, that's brilliant. Like, heck yeah. You know, I'm like, we're, we're spending $65,000 on a piece of farm equipment and you guys are running an old Briggs and Stratton tiller that I think I've got in the shed behind the house, you know, and, and you're driving to town on it. That that's innovation, man. I mean, that's like, that's being able to work with the stuff. That's, that's the thing that I'm always impressed with, with makers is that, so many folks who are in, they're too close to the problem. They go, well, we can't fix it because we don't have what we need to. I need this and I need this and I need this. But you throw a bunch of makers in a room and they look at a problem and it's like throwing a, 
a tuna sandwich in a room with a bunch of hungry people, you know? They just look at it and they just get, I mean, they get down on their hands and knees and they start figuring out, well, if I had, you know, if I had a stick of butter and six straws, you know, they're going to MacGyver it into working. It's not Sigma, but they're going to solve the problem, right? It's, and I think that's the, that's the mindset. That's innovation for me, you know? It's the out-of-the-box thinking, right? Yeah. Well, and, and that, that stresses me out a little bit because I meet a lot of young engineers today. That I meet a lot of young engineers who have a maker mindset. And that goes back to that thing that I said earlier. But, you know, we, we kind of educate people out of using their imagination and, and trying things. And I think that, that, that – and that's, that's a terrible – I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, use that universally. Because I meet so many incredible teachers and, and educational systems every day. But I do think that, that we tend to, because we want a result at the end, we kind of sigma education too much. And we just try to efficiency it all the way to the end, you know. Standardization, Standardization that's right. Take, take the test, fill in the dots, right? And you passed. Um, but... Being able to use your imagination, which is why companies are calling us today and saying we need someone who can not only run this machine but fix the machine. Where do we find them? And we go, well, go to Makerspace. And that's a, for years, that was a real turnoff for industry. Uh, when we were in Little Rock at the Innovation Hub, um, Aloha Boats, uh, I will mention them because I, cause this is a great story and they're wonderful people. Um, they are an incredible company. They do pontoon boats. They've been doing it for, I think, going on 60 years now. And they've done everything by hand for years. They, uh, their welders would actually use plywood jigs, and they would plasma cut around these jigs, aluminum, and then curve it and weld it together, and that's how they were making their pontoons. They came into the innovation hub and they saw our CNC machine for the first time. And they said, hey, that's really smart. That's probably something we should do, right? So uh, I introduced them to uh, the company that we bought our CNC from. That, that company came in and uh, installed this huge, just incredible CNC. I think it was an 8 by, by 12 or 8 by 16. Huge CNC. And uh, that's how they were going to cut their pieces and they were, you know, stepping into the 21st century with digital manufacture. And this is a successful company. They've been doing this for, you know, now 60 years. And they're incredible. But this was their first foray into this idea of digital modern manufacturing. And uh, this company came in. They installed the machine. They did three days of training with their crew. And then they left. And about three days later, one of the executives at Aloha Boats called me and said, hey, um, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know what we're doing. And uh, I said, oh. And they said, can you come give us a hand? And I said, yeah. And I went over, and I was going to go give him a hand. I took, uh, I think, Sean uh, Prater I took with me. But Jeremy Job was there. He's a member. Jeremy was a member of the Makerspace who used the CNC a lot. And he just wanted to see their CNC machine. And uh, he said, can I go? And I went, yeah, come on. Let's go. Let's all go. And we all drove about – four miles, five miles away, and, and went in, and they had this big, beautiful, brand-new CNC machine. It was very impressive. And um, we started showing them, like, oh, well, here's what you're doing. Here's this, and and blah, blah, blah. And Jeremy got up, and he got into it. And I said, Jeremy's one of our members. He's really good on the CNC. And uh, we spent time with him. We worked him through some stuff, and and uh, that's all I could do. You know, I said, well, you know, I, I'm, you, you guys are good. I, I said, but we got to – I got to go back. I said, you can call us and we can help more. And Jeremy just looked at us and he goes, well, can I, can I stay with him for a while? And I went, yeah, man, go right ahead. <laughs> the next day they hired him and he spent two weeks taking all of these patterns that they had had for possibly decades and turning them into CAD drawings, creating the files that they needed, and then setting up that machine and running. And they, and that's what set them into the now digital manufacturing, right? But it was, uh, it was a young guy who uh, they didn't know, but he had the talent and the skill. He didn't have a degree, didn't have, 
you know, it, it wasn't certified, wasn't it, but he was what they needed. And I feel like that's kind of one of those things that we're all we're all sort of beginning to discover because of things like COVID and a boat getting turned sideways in the Suez Canal. We're all suddenly going, what do we need? And it's a very different mindset because we realize that that um, innovation isn't just a word. You know, it it is a mindset. It is a skill. It is, and then how do we develop those skills and how do you do it? How do you encourage it? so that people are inspired and people are, they want to do it, right? So um, when I left the Innovation Hub, um, I actually consulted for a while and, and I would work with cities and they'd say, well, you know, we, we want a makerspace. So rather than just go, oh, well, you know, here, let's put together a, a makerspace. So you, you're going to need these items, you're going to need this much square footage, you're going to need these things because those are the questions that they would ask. How many square feet do we need? How much are the pieces going to cost? What do we need to buy? And, uh, oh, yeah, and I guess we need some people who can run it, I guess. And those were really how it went. But when I would go and consult, and I was apparently a really bad consultant because I didn't realize that what good consultants do is just tell people what they want to hear. Uh, instead, I just told them what they needed to know. So I would show up in a city, and I would get there a couple of days early, and I'd check out the city, and I'd go, well, what's – what do you have here? You know, it's a, I, you want to grow a community. You need a community in that space. You need to have these things. So uh, there is one that, example that I can give you that I, a city that I went to and, and uh, uh, I'm probably over time, but you know, that's the way it works. Um, there was a city that I went to. Uh, no, I've got three minutes that um, they said, yeah, we want to have a maker space. And I went and I visited and I and I walked around and and uh, I said okay. So then I you know the day that I showed up to meet with their chamber of commerce and some other people who wanted to invest in it, uh, I did a presentation. And in my presentation, I said, and here are some of the tools that you need. So I had a CNC machine and they all went yeah yeah CNC machine. Then the next thing that I had was, and here's a. Uh, rack for a bicycle so you can work on a bicycle and repair a bicycle and I, I could literally hear people going who and then I said and this is uh these are tools that you need to repair skateboards and to do this and they were just like what and then finally some guy went whoa whoa, whoa, whoa hold on hold on a minute and he goes uh no we need people who build robots and I said sure and he goes, so why are you showing us the stuff to fix a bicycle and skateboards? And I said, well, you're a university town. And they said, yeah. And I said, so I talked to all these people that would build robots in your space. And he goes, yeah. And I said, and they all ride bicycles and skateboards. And they went, what does that mean? And I said, they can build robots at the college. Why do they want to be in your space? And that's how you grow a community, right? It's not thinking about it's not thinking about what you want, it's thinking about what they need. And they did not take my advice. Yep. Was it NYC Resistor? NYC Resistor? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Right. They still do that. All access to the tools you didn't have. I think I think the 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 thing that a lot of people talk to me. Well, when I was consulting too, they would they would say. Um, great, we're going to open a, a maker space. What's the business model? And for me, a maker space, like this library, you go down there and you see this space, right? And it's there and it's free for everybody. Innovation. You want to create innovation. So there's, there was this guy named Carnegie who came along. And back in the day, Carnegie said, hey, you know what would be a really good idea? How about we open these buildings – we call them libraries, and we put a bunch of books inside those buildings so, so anybody off the street can go in and get a book for free and read that book and gain knowledge. And that's, you know, Dale Carnegie was like, well, you know, we, we need these things. This is, this is good for everybody. Well, makerspaces at the end of the day, everybody said, we need this. We want innovation. But then they said, now how does it make money? So when I went in and I and I was a consultant and I told you apparently I wasn't a very good consultant because I didn't I wasn't telling them what they want to hear, I was telling them what they need to hear. So they'd say, "What's the business model?" And my response would always be this: "So why do you want a makerspace? Well, we want innovation. We think that innovation is going to be, and we want to build small businesses, and we want to do this, and and we and then that's going to improve our economy. These things are going to happen." And I said, "Okay, so it's what you're saying is it's good for your community." They were like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I said, all right. So if I was a consultant, they're like, yeah. And you hired me as a consultant. Yeah. And I was the consultant that you hired to build a library. And they all kind of looked at each other. And I said, would the first question out of your mouth be, what's the business model? Why do you have a library? Well, we have a library because we think it's going to bring innovation and it's going to be good for the community and it's going to start businesses and these things are going to happen. And I, I go, why is this different? Why is it different? Well, you know, equipment costs money. So do books. So does the building. But you're willing to give, not just give money, but, you know, millions of dollars to a library so that you can put your name on it because that's this habit that we've gotten into. And library makerspaces like this, like one of the things that libraries struggle with the most is staying relevant in a modern time where we have the Internet. So I've always looked at it this way. The, the idea is this, museums, right? There should be, you, can, you need three legs on a stool for a stool to stand up. So museums. Museums are there for inspiration. You walk into a museum, you experience it, you walk out and you want to be an astronaut or an artist. You're inspired. So the next thing you want to do with that inspiration is you want to become informed. You seek out information. So libraries, the Internet, that's where those are our, our places to become informed, right? We have inspiration. We seek information. When you gain that information, what naturally as human beings is the next thing we want to do. We want to take that inspiration and that information and we want to apply it to something. That's what a makerspace is. It's a place for application. It's not only you're going in to learn it, but you're doing it. So it's the third leg to the stool. Why, why do we treat them any different? Why, and, and the tough thing about a library makerspace, this, the space here at Fayetteville Public Library, beautiful. Couldn't have been better designed. It's its, its own space. It has its own space in the building. 
but I've traveled to maker spaces in libraries across the country. And I will tell you, there's library culture and there's maker culture. And sometimes the maker space is in the middle of the library in a little open area and there's three 3D printers and they and there's people who are excited and they want to grow it out, but they're struggling to exist in the library culture. And that's tough. It's tough for the library and it's tough for the makerspace. The library wants it and the makerspace wants to grow and people want both. They don't always have to be in the same space, but if you're going to do it in the same space, that this is the model. This is what they've done here. It's brilliant. But you know, a lot of times it's because it's not because the library says we need to have a makerspace. It's because the library that the makerspace is in is struggling to remain relevant because the old families in the town are still, well, that's the library that I used when I was a kid and my kids used and and they are struggling. They're struggling to remain relevant. So what's the library of the 21st century going to look like? Oh, it's definitely ahead of most libraries. Mm -hmm. I love a book, yeah. Right. So the the internet I, I love the idea, and some, some libraries across the country are embracing this. I like the idea of libraries as bastions of the humanities, like theater and art. and. But you still have the space, right? And you still have the culture. Well, but I think but but here's the problem. Here's the problem. And and I agree with you to to a point, but here's the here's the real issue. Not everybody has a maker mindset. And we still unfortunately have a culture in the United States as much as we all try to embrace this idea of innovation and we try and say, well, you know, that's that's this amazing thing. We were talking about AI earlier, right? And, you know, that's the new looming fear. But it's more than that. I, I think the biggest problem that we have in the United States is a culture issue. And the culture issue is this. We, I talk to people all the time and they go, this you know, makers are wonderful. It's just incredible. You makers, you're so smart. You do these things. But at the end of the day, the attitude is still a little bit about, well, you're just working with your hands. Any monkey could do that. And I see it all the time. It's, and, well, let me, let me finish. Well, But I, but I think I don't think it's that. I think that everybody's passionate about what they're doing, but not everybody does the same thing, you know. And some, and we all tend to like. For me, the maker movement, and obviously for you, that feels like something that's more important. But is it more important than what somebody else wants? Mm I, I think I I, th I think I think that we can I think that it's more about accessibility. Is it accessible to you? And that's and you know just like makerspaces, like I said, you know. Well, let me let me let me let me let me wrap this up real quick. Um, I I hear what you're saying. I I think that I think that um, you know getting back to makerspaces, what makerspaces really do. 
having access to tools, having access to knowledge, having access to that thing that you're passionate about, and just having the access and the ability is how you grow those communities. And I think that we all have that opportunity to do it. It's just a matter of whether um, whether the accessibility is there for, for the community you live in. Um, and on that, I'm going to wrap it up. And thank you guys for coming. And um, thanks for thanks thanks for listening. <laughs>